And then finally, in the last part of this opening chapter, which is functioning almost like in a kind of epitome of the whole book, he now gets on the importance of works. Works. This is what it says. But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who observes his natural face in a mirror. Another analogy, right? For he observes himself and goes away and at once forgets what he looks like. But he who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer that forgets, but a doer that acts, he shall be blessed in his doing. For if anyone thinks he is religious, and look at this, if anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, there it is again, but deceives his heart, this man's religion is in vain. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained by the world. He just said a lot in a little. Let me make a few quick points here. All right, first of all, if you go to your notes, the notes might help us get through this. He's opening up here the theme of faith and works, which he's going to return to at length, right? And he's emphasizing the importance of the fact that it's not going to be enough just to believe in the truth of Christianity. You're going to have to live it. You're going to have to be a doer of the word. Not just a listener to the word, but a doer of the word, right? And he gives this example of a man in the mirror, right? Looking at himself, seeing what he looks like, but then once he turns away, what happens to the image? When you're looking in the mirror, it's clear, it's precise, it's defined. But as you go away, what happens? Yeah, you free, it fades, right? And he says, that's not how the word should be with us, right? We need to look into the perfect law of liberty. And for him, the law here is still the scriptures too, right? Right? The scriptures, and we contemplate the scriptures, gaze into them in such a way that we are configured to them, transformed by them, right? We look into this perfect law of liberty and of freedom and begin to live it out in what we do. And here he opens up something that's very, very very important. This is what I want to spend the rest of our time focusing on. This whole question of what is true religion? What is true religion? In James chapter 1, 26 to 27, he talks about the fact that some people think they have religion, but they don't. And the Greek word he uses here for religion is threskeia. Threskeia, which comes over in the Latin as religio. Now, on page 17, I gave you a little excursus on this. I want to look, read through this with you. Because how many of you have heard in our own day that someone say they are spiritual but not what? Religious. Everybody's nodding right now. I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. Now, it's fascinating to me that that would be the case because we have in the Bible a positive description of the word religion. This is biblical, right? Because James is in the Bible. And yet... In popular Christianity, religion has come to have a bad name, as if it's something we don't want to be, right? We just want to be spiritual. Now, I think that's very telling. And so let's look at what religion means here and see why that might be the case. So let's put it in context. So I wrote a little excursus on page 17, spiritual but not religious. So the word religion, threskeia in Latin religio, occurs only four times in the entire New Testament. Once it's used to refer to the religion of Israel, the book of Acts. Once it's used to refer to the illicit worship of angels in the Colossians. And twice it refers to the practice of the Christian faith, and that's in James. So this is the only time in the New Testament the word religion ever occurs with reference to Christianity. So this is important. It's kind of unique, right? So what did it mean? What did the religion mean in the first century AD? And what to what does it refer here in James? Now, if we look carefully at ancient parallels, we'll discover that the Greek word for religion was reused to refer to expressions of devotion to God or the gods in paganism, primarily through what? Acts of worship. So you express your devotion to God or to the gods, Judaism to God, through an act of worship, sacrifice, prayer, attending the synagogue. This would be what? Religion. Threskeia, right? It connotes 
outward acts of devotion, outward acts of worship, right? Now, the word could be used to be described worship in Judaism, like in Philo and Josephus, or paganism and pagan writers, as well as in early Christian uh, writings like the Apostolic Fathers. They'll talk about Christian worship using this language of religion or threskeia. So in light of these parallels, what James seems to be doing is criticizing Christians who engage in liturgical acts of worship. So they engage in liturgical acts of, of worship or devotion directed to God, but they neglect what other kind of act? Acts of charity directed to the love of who? Neighbor. Such as care for widows, orphan, and the poor. Now, in the late 20th century, it became popular to refer to religion in the West as something negative, as a purely outward expression of obedience to a set of rules and regulations. Now, pause there. That's what people mean. When they say I'm spiritual but not religious, they're talking about the fact that they don't feel any compunction to have to participate in an organized, external, liturgical form of what? Worship. Right? It's just me and my Bible. It's just me and Jesus. It's a reaction against the idea of an organized liturgical expression of worship so that when you say spiritual, it's a code word for non-liturgical, right? And non-organized, right? Like people often say, I don't, I don't believe in organized religion. And I always want to ask, so you believe in disorganized religion? I mean, what kind of, <laughs> what kind of religion do you want there? But it's expressing a sentiment that's popular in secular society too, where outward public acts of worship are what? They're frowned on. Keep your religion where? Yeah, you keep it to yourself. It's personal. It's an individual affair. In a secular context, you keep your religion private. You don't bring it out into the public. So you can be spiritual, but you better not be religious. Because see, the public and outward has impacts on society as a whole, right? So anyway, that's, I mean, I'm kind of fast forwarding to modern times, but I hope you can see there's, there's a deep issue here that James is getting at that when we're talking about religion, we're focusing on that outward expression. Now, in James's time, in the writing of this letter, the issue is slightly different. Liturgical acts of worship are viewed positively, and in fact, some people take great pride in them, right? But what are they lacking, according to James? The acts of charity, the love of neighbor, all right? So in the late 20th century, it became popular to refer to religion as something negative, purely outward expression. Defined in this way, faith is often pitted against religion, with the former being de defined as sincere, spiritual, and inward, while the latter is defined as insincere, earthly, and outward. In addition, it's also become popular for some to refer to themselves as spiritual but not religious. To the extent that this self-description is meant to signify that one believes in the Christian God but doesn't engage in cultic acts of worship or acts of charity, it may well be accurate. You're not worshiping God right? And you're not engaging in any kind of acts of charity. Yeah, you could say you're spiritual, but not religious. However, from the perspective of James, this is no, by no means a positive thing to be spiritual, but not religious. Indeed, James assumes that true religion includes both the worship of God and what? The love of neighbor. Otherwise, it is worthless, right? So, part of James's concern then for his teaching on works and faith that we're going to look at when we come back has to do with the fact that he seems to be identifying a problem amongst his community. Namely, that they're engaging in outward expressions of worship, right? But they're failing in acts of charity. It's going to lead straight into chapter 2 with this prejudice against the poor in his community, right? In these communities that he's going to deal with. Now, what's interesting to me about this is that this tension that he's identifying here I think is still with us today. On the one hand, we can express our religion through worship and love of God. On the other hand, we can express it through acts of charity that will demonstrate our love and neighbor. And what is James doing here? He's saying that true religion has to have what? It has to have both. 
That tension has been around since the first century and is still around to this day. There are some people who will tend to reduce all of religion to what I do on Sunday, right? In the pew, in the liturgical context, right? Then there are other people who would tend to reduce it all to charity. This is very popular in the modern world. What do people say? I'm a good person. I don't kill anybody. You know, I give to charity. Therefore, what? I should go to heaven, right? That's the implication. I'm, I'm good. Why? Well, because I love my neighbor. Other people will say, well, I go to mass. I'm very reverent. I say my prayers, right? But when I see the poor and I see the suffering, what do I do? Keep on walking by. Well, I love God. That's not enough. No. James is saying you have to have both of these. Otherwise, it's not true religion. It's not true face to face care. And notice what, how he puts it up. He says true religion is to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself what? This is important. Unstained by the world. And by that he means the sinful world, right? Once again, some people think if they just abstain from evil, that's sufficient, right? Think of the Pharisees here. What did Jesus critique them for? You tithe your mint, your dill, your cumin, right? You keep the law down to the littlest letter. But what do you neglect? Justice, mercy, right? Charity. You should have done all the things. You need to keep the law, but you should have also done the, these greater things, justice and mercy as well, right? So you got the Pharisees. There's always this temptation to legalism, like the Pharisees on the one hand. I've got it on my eyes. I've crossed all my T's. I'm done. On the other hand, you'll sometimes find a tendency, I don't know if what we would call it here, it's a kind of activism, yeah, that's a good word, which says, well, as long as I've done good things, that's enough. I don't need to worship God. Right? And James is saying, no, 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 it's, they both go together. Love of God, love of neighbor. You can't pick which tablet of the commandments you're going to keep, in other words. You got to keep the ones that love God and you have to keep the ones that love neighbor. And when you put the two together, then you're dealing with true religion, a religion that's going to bear fruit. It's not going to be worthless before God. Right?